the lawsuit has, has resulted in court rulings that require the reunification of uh, families, which again, there was not otherwise a plan to do that. Uh, uh, in fact, one of my uh, law school classmates re uh, quit his job at the Department of Homeland Security not too long ago uh, and wrote about it um, because uh, he was, his job there was to safeguard civil rights for the Department of Homeland Security, and he realized that what they were doing was inconsistent with the job that he, that he had to do. Tonight, we present a program that could not be more timely. By the way, what time is it? 7.30? <laughs> nine nine o'clock was the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who wrote this? Fiona? Of course. Uh, funding of the border wall at the heart of a partial government shutdown for almost 18 days, affecting more than 800,000 federal workers. Democrats and Republicans remain deeply divided over this country's immigration crisis. The administration is demanding more than $5 billion to build a new wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. The wall is one of the tenets of this administration's emphasis on security first. Other measures, including the travel ban and pledges to deport millions of undocumented immigrants, all raise questions on how to balance keeping America safe from terrorism while still being a nation of immigrants. That leads us to our panel this evening, the immigration debate balancing security and compassion. And now, Joel, a few words about our panel. On our panel this evening, we are pleased to uh, welcome Matthew Siegel. Uh, Mr. Siegel has been legal director of the ACLU of Massachusetts since 2012, leading a team of civil rights lawyers. And he has lit litigated cases that halted the Muslim ban and overturned more than 20,000 wrongful convictions. Previously, as an assistant federal defender, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> Previously, as an assistant federal defender, Matt argued a case that led to hundreds of exonerations and resentencings. Thank you for joining us. Rodrigo Saavedra is a DACA recipient and has been a, a community organizer for more than seven years. After graduating from Clark University, he worked for Cosecha, a movement fighting for immigrant rights. He now serves as the Memory Program Director at the INE Institute. Thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs> Jessica Vaughn serves as Director of Policy Studies for the Center of Immigration Studies, a Washington, D.C.-based immigration research institute. An expert on immigration policy and operations, Ms. Vaughn educates policymakers and agencies on immigration topics. Thank you for joining us. And our moderator this evening is Julia Preston. Ms. Preston is a contributing writer at the Marshall Project, a nonprofit journalism organization focusing on criminal justice and immigration. She previously worked at the New York Times as the national correspondent covering immigration. Thank you very much for leading the conversation. I think we can be very grateful to the JCC of Greater Boston for the remarkable prescience that they organized this panel on immigration on the very evening that the President of the United States is going to make an address to the nation. We're going to try and wrap up the program on time so that those people who are interested in seeing the President can do that. Uh, what's remarkable, I think, about the impasse between the President uh, of the United States and the newly empowered Democrats on Capitol Hill an impasse which has forced some 800,000 federal workers to go without pay during a holiday season, is that the actual policy differences between the White House and Republicans and Democrats on border security are not all that great. The recently departed White House Chief of Staff, retired General John Kelly, told the Los Angeles Times in December, to be honest, it's not a wall. Kelly said Homeland Security officials had long since given up on plans for a concrete wall and were looking at variations of fences and bollards and other barriers appropriate to the changing terrain of the border. Trump himself has acknowledged that agents patrolling the border reject concrete walls, favoring tall fences with slats because they can't see through concrete to observe dangers on the Mexican side. Last February, Democrats offered President Trump $25 billion, five times his current request, for a border security package, including some wall construction, 
in exchange for a pathway to citizenship for young immigrants known as dreamers. The president spurned that proposal. Today, Republicans and Democrats could very likely agree on measures that included more funding for agents and equipment to fortify the ports of entry, for example. More helicopters, drones, sensors, and other surveillance technology, more anti-narcotics intelligence capability. Instead, here we are, with a stunning irony. Tens of thousands of the federal employees affected by the shutdown are Border Patrol and TSA agents and Customs and Border Protection officers, employees who have to keep working even though they are not being paid. The very Border Protection employees that President Trump says he, says he most avidly supports. By this time, the President has made it clear he isn't really interested in what policy wonks say is the most effective and efficient border security. President Trump wants a wall with a capital W. He wants a monument. He wants a big physical structure that materializes his concept of immigration and the grave risks he believes it poses for the United States. He wants a barrier that he can point to and say he is keeping out the drug traffickers, the human smugglers, the MS-13 gang members, the rapists and cop killers, the Islamic terrorists, who he says are hiding among the migrants and the families with children and the refugees who are making their way towards our borders. No amount of fact-checking and policy analysis has changed the core idea that animates President Trump's politics, an idea that has always been part of America's social thought, but has only occasionally risen to the salience that President Trump has given it, the idea that immigration is basically dangerous for the American people. As the president has dug in on the political symbolism of his wall, the Democrats have dug in as well. At the beginning of the shutdown, they were arguing that the wall was just a gross waste of taxpayer money, an idea which most civil engineers would probably uh, support. But now Speaker Pelosi, as she rejects any consideration of border security funding until the government reopens, is articulating a much broader counter view, a defense of immigration. A wall is an immorality, she says. It's not who we are as a nation. Meanwhile, there is actually an expanding crisis at the border with Mexico. But it's not a crisis that a border wall can fix now or in the future. This is the crisis in our immigration system, which is failing on many fronts. At the Mexican border, a surge of families from Central America, many running for their lives from barbarous gangs and turf-warring narcos, have, has placed a crushing overload on the asylum system in the immigration courts. Last year, asylum claims increased by 67% over 2017 in one year alone. At least 786,000 cases are backed up in the immigration courts, 786,000 cases. United States law says that migrants can ask for asylum if they are on American soil. But underfunded courts and an underdeveloped and dysfunctional legal system have not been able to keep pace with the generous principles of our asylum statutes. And the Trump administration has responded by attempting systematically to close down the legal opportunities for asylum seekers, as well as for many other immigrants. And yet, President Trump's policies intended to be the most forbidding de deterrent to new migrants appear to be having little dissuasive effect. So our discussion today will center on the troubles and tensions in our immigration system and the aspiration and need to find a balance between security and compassion as we debate how to fix it. So I'll start by asking questions about the border wall, and then we'll bring it back to local issues in this area. I'm going to start with Matthew. President Trump's border wall is part of the administration's plan to create deterrence to dissuade migrants from coming, trying to cross the uh, Mexican border. Another effort uh, in that regard was the family separation policy this summer. The ACLU was in the forefront of litigating over the family separation policy. How did you get involved in that? And what was the impact of your litigation? Where does it stand now? Uh, OK. Um, First of all, thank you all very much for having me. Thanks to the JCC, um, and thank you all for being here. I, um, the, the, there is a slight connection. Uh, there's this connection, as you say, between family separation policy and this idea of a wall. 
um, it's part of an effort to keep people out. Um, one of the, but the, one of the most important things about the family separation policy is that it was expressly designed to hurt people as a way of dissuading them from coming to the United States, uh, and to hurt people in the most, in one of the most devastating ways you can hurt them, which is to take away their children. And when I say take away, that's a word that I use intentionally because um, we now know that that was both the policy and that there was uh, no plan to, to reunite um, parents with their, with their children at the moment that they began doing this. So as I understand it, when you take something away without any plan to give it back, that's stealing. So we're talking about stealing people and stealing kids. And um, when the, so then this was, a, this was a, a issue that was litigated by the National ICU, so my colleagues in New York uh, learned about this. They learned about a Congolese woman uh, who'd been separated from her daughter as part of this policy. Uh, and they began to get into it, learn more. And they uh, uh, traveled and met with her. And then they filed a lawsuit, and this became a class action lawsuit to, to stop this policy. Um, their Just to be clear about that, so that lawsuit was filed actually many months prior to the big events surrounding family separation. That's right. That that uh, it, it sort of that lawsuit had been going on for a little while, and then partly th through um, some folks in the media who began to take an interest in it, and some revelations that came out, like the fact that it was an intentional policy of uh, doing a number of things to cause a separation, but one of them was to to prosecute people for the misdemeanor offense of uh, illegal border crossing and to use that those prosecutions as a mechanism to separate the parents from the children without reuniting them. And um, so it took a while for that all to come out, but by the time it became a major news story, this ACLU nationwide lawsuit had been going on for a little while. Um, where that ended up was that uh, the policy was halted by executive order and, um, and the uh, lawsuit has, has resulted in court rulings that require the reunification of uh, families, which again, there was not otherwise a plan to do that. Um, uh, in fact, one of my uh, law school classmates re uh, quit his job at the Department of Homeland Security not too long ago uh, and wrote about it um, because uh, he was, his job there was to safeguard civil rights for the Department of Homeland Security, and he realized that what they were doing was inconsistent with the job that he, he had to do. Um, here in Massachusetts, we, uh, we represented one woman whose daughter was taken from her at the border, and just to give you a sense of um, how heart-wrenching the situation can be, when, um, when she learned that this was going to happen, it was because someone who works for our government um, uh, said to her, well, do they, do they celebrate Mother's Day where you're from? And she says, yes. And she, he says, well, happy Mother's Day. And then that's when they told her that they were taking her daughter. So, um, you know, we, we were able to play a small role and help to get her, her um, daughter back together with her. And there was, a, you know, they uh, got back together at Logan Airport. It was great. Um, but, you know, to get it, connecting this back up to your to your overall question about balancing um, security and compassion. There are some issues, um, and I know our um, other panelists can speak to this, where that is required to think about, th thinking about balancing security and compassion. But on so many of the issues that we've seen in our work, family separation, this wall that's really sort of a monument to a person, um, that is not what's going on. That is not the effort. It's not an attempt to balance security and compassion. It is an attempt to hurt people. So Jessica, um, what do you think about the wall? Is the wall, is, is the president uh, on the right track to be insisting on the physical wall? Is this a, is this been, has this been a useful way of framing this discussion? Well, I think it, it has, uh, first of all, there are, I do believe there are legitimate operational reasons and security reasons to have physical barriers at the border. They definitely work. If, uh, I, I imagine that you've traveled to San Diego sector and El Paso and other places as I have along the border, and there is a huge difference because of 
either the triple fencing or other fencing that's been placed there. Um, I think it has been, um, what, what this discussion has done is really show Americans the different approaches to border security. Um, although I, I tend to agree with you that, well, certainly we know from past experience that even um, many of the folks in Congress who are opposing providing President Trump with the $5 billion for the wall that he's asking for have supported these projects in the past, um, but for political reasons now have decided that, that's, that, that they're not going to. And, you know, this debate is happening over a spending proposal which is small in the context of the entire federal budget, even the Department of Homeland Security budget, um, but it's like a proxy for the immigration issue in general. And there is a great divide now among our political leaders, um, especially in Congress, over how to approach the issue. And everybody's decided to make a stand on this issue. The president, yeah, we need the wall, the president's right, he should go for that money. Um, but it's not a silver bullet by any stretch of the imagination. There are so many other problems that need to be dealt with as well. The asylum system is one. I, I think, um, and, and, and I've seen a shift in the president's approach to this just over the last week as he's, he's now not talking about just funding for the wall. He's put together a proposal for funding um, at, through these negotiations that includes uh, uh, funds to take care of this huge influx of migrants coming with children um, because of the catch and release policies. He's asking for more um, border agents and ICE agents. And he's asking for more facilities for Customs and Border Protection, the border security agency, to use um, that presumably would be where a lot of the people who are now being released could stay. I mean, in recent months, we've seen a huge spike in the number of people arriving with kids because of um, prior court cases. The government can't detain them. Um, most of the ones who are asking for asylum don't actually end up requesting asylum. Uh, we lose track of them because they're released into the country. So this is unsustainable, so that's why those pieces are equally important. But ultimately, the reason people are coming here is to have the opportunity to work. So the, the federal government needs to find, if, if we're going to control illegal immigration, we need to cut off the magnet that is bringing people here illegally, and that is the opportunity to work, and the wall isn't gonna do anything about that. The wall also is not going to help with the problem of people overstaying visas. People who come in on the visa waiver program or get a visa and, and overstay that. And, and those, again, that comes back to the prospect of employment. So there are a lot of other tools that could be used. He's not gonna get money for those things on a spending bill, because they're not so much spending issues, policy issues, um, you know, Congress needs to change some laws, um, but and also this I, is the proxy for the whole immigration issue. Is it so. fair for, for some federal employees to be asking why this debate has suddenly been framed within the context of a shutdown of the federal government? I mean, it seems like it's a, very, a vast debate that... Right, and that's why I think it, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that they're gonna keep it narrowly focused on funding for the wall, because that's what's, and, and, or, and some border security as well, and the wall, using the wall kind of metaphorically, I guess, uh, barriers at the border, rather than trying to solve all of these other immigration policy issues over $5 billion. Yeah, yeah. Rodrigo, you came to the United States as a young child from Peru, um, you didn't cross the southwest border illegally. The whole border debate is really not uh, a personal issue for you. It's kind of remote. And when you hear the president talking about the wall and the need to keep out these criminals and, you know, evildoers who, and, and, 
and narco traffickers and the and the the negative imagery that he has created uh, around immigration. What what do you think? How how do you react to that? What is it? What, how, do, how, do, how do you experience that, and how are immigrants experiencing that here in Boston? Well, uh, the way that I see it is there's a fundamental issue with looking at the border wall as a solution to the problems of migration. And I think uh, even though he depicts a lot of people coming in as being uh, you know, drug lords or working for the cartel or being criminals, a lot of the people that are coming in are coming in because they're looking for jobs, as you're saying, and they're looking for the opportunity to work. And I think one of the issues is, systematically, that problem isn't going to be solved by a wall. And I think one of the big issues is because here in the United States, uh, whether we want a wall or not, we, we have to understand that there's sort of an economic dependency in certain parts of our industries with immigrants that are coming in through the, through the border. And I think once we start changing that, we're going to start seeing some of the effects of what uh, of you know what it means to what it means to have an economic dependency on undocumented immigrants in in industries in the United States. So, for example, around 53 percent of undocumented uh, are, of farm workers are undocumented. So, the agriculture industry is largely uh, held by the, the work that undocumented immigrants do. So, I feel like in order to solve the problem, we need to think a little. We need to sort of zoom out and think a little bit more largely and say, you know what. We can't, we're, we can't think of this in an isolationist way. We can't think about the, of politics as just being domestic. But we really have to understand what is going on in Central America and South America that are making people come here. So if, if it's possible to address some of, the, some of the grievances that have occurred in, in, the, in some of the countries in the past, whether you know, through US intervention in Guatemala, in Honduras, when they were trying to uh, essentially work themselves into being maybe something that the United States doesn't want to be, but I think what's what ended up happening very recently is that there's been a lot of poverty in these places, and that creates a lot of vulnerable people. That's going to create a lot of people that are going to take a chance to go somewhere where they feel like they could have an economic opportunity for themselves and for their children. Now, that's not to say there's you know local uh, governments are not corrupt or anything like that, but I think a wall in itself is not going to solve the issue of undocumented immigration. And I think for really to solve it, that means we need to be able to figure out how is it that we can make the conditions of people better in the countries that they're in uh, if, in order to do that. And I think for the people that are here, we need to, I, they're already here, and I think that they deserve a right to stay here. Uh, to ha because I feel like a large majority has been contributing to the US economy in order to, uh, to, in order to support many different things. I know if, here in, in Massachusetts specifically, uh, the, the hospitality industry is, I think, supported maybe by around 15% uh, by undocumented immigrants. So I think we need to start figuring out what are the ways that we can support people here. And I think our reaction to the immigrant wall, to the wall, is something that has, is generally something that, you know, we've been experiencing for a long time. It's just more conversations on enforcement. It's, for us, it means more separation from our families. It means more uh, it means more fear of being able to go out to work, and I think, gener like th I think the way that we see it here in the immigrant communities here is, it's, I think it's, it's an argument built upon fear of the other, and I think that in itself is larger than the immigration debate. We need to solve that. So can I, can I just yeah, go ahead. I mean, because you alluded to this also, um, it's it's been described. Uh, uh, the president or or others who support immigration enforcement, it's been described as fear of immigration or fear of immigrants, I don't see that at all. I, I think that um, what people have is, understand is that there are risks to uncontrolled immigration or not knowing who is coming in, not of all immigrants, but of bad actors who are able to take advantage of a system that is out of control. But I, I think what the, the question that gets raised is that the president keeps talking about the wall, a wall, and the type of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's a pretty broad consensus in the country that we don't want terrorists coming into our country. We, you know, there are kinds of people that we don't want coming into the country, but the solution that the president is proposing seems out of, so out of, line with the population that he's describing that I think that 
might be what creates what, what do you think about that, Rodrigo? Yeah, I think the way the argument is set up is, you know, we are letting bad hombres in. They, they, there's connotations there. There's, you know, there's, there's certain parts of what Trump is saying that, that, that have a certain sense of racism or, an apply, or, in, a, or in other ways uh, attempts to, to stigmatize a large portion of people that are coming here for economic reasons uh, as being part of this whole. And I, and, and I agree there needs to be a more orderly way that we organize the flow of immigration. However, I don't think the wall is going to be the, the way that we're going to be able to solve that. Well, certainly breaching the barriers that do exist in, say, uh, uh, San Diego sector, south of San Diego, near San Isidro, where people were climbing through over the, the barriers that are clearly obsolete, um, that they were able to breach in order to try to enter the country illegally. I mean, to me, that's a very, uh, you know, apt illustration of why these barriers that we have there need to be upgraded and replaced and that they do serve an operational value. So it's, it's not the ultimate solution to border security, but it does, it, it, it is one tool that works and that we need more of. So maybe we can move away from the border and talk a little bit about some, a population that's been coming to this part of the world uh, for a long time in particular, which are the refugee, the refugee population. And um, Robert Bowers, who was the accused shooter in the killings in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, singled out Hyas, the Jewish refugee aid, or aid organization, as a particular target of his hatred. He said, Hyas likes to bring invaders that kill our people. Uh, that was a social media post that he wrote just before the attack. President Trump started his term with a broad ban on travel from mainly Muslim countries, suspending the refugee program and banning travel from certain countries. Uh, he described the refugee program at that time as a kind of a sieve for, uh, for terrorists, that there they were really very insufficient vetting practices in the refugee programs. After, as we know, after repeated rejections by the federal courts, the administration whittled down and revised the travel restrictions until they did survive review by the Supreme Court. So, Matthew, this question would go for you. You were engaged early on in the travel ban um, litigation, and I'm wondering, you know, how you, looking back on that, how you see the impact of that litigation and how you think that the administration's way of framing the refugee uh, process of coming to the United States has impacted public perceptions about refugees. Sure. Uh, so maybe I'll talk a little bit about the travel ban and then sort of connect that up to the refugee yeah. question. Yeah. So um, uh, in uh, an evening in January 2017, I was having burgers with uh, my family and uh, got a call that um, there were some people being held at Logan Airport under the travel ban and uh, got on the computer and rattled off a complaint with the help of the National ACLU and some other folks. And, um, you know, and then we were having a court hearing in the middle of uh, the night, uh, which were at around 2 o'clock in the morning on a on, was then Saturday, Sunday morning, getting a, a temporary order to, to halt the travel ban. And um, you know, one of the things that, that that was about was about chaos, right? I mean, the people that we were on, on whose behalf we filed that lawsuit, uh, I'm not sure of the exact timing, but either they or people like them were banned in midair, right? Uh, and um, they were banned based on, you know, the president's dislike of Muslim countries and the people in them. The president, I'm, those are not, that's not my explanation, that's the president's explanation of what he was doing. Uh, and um, and then what happened after, after a series of defeats in court was that there was a new travel ban that was issued and then another travel ban. And the effect of that was to sort of launder the president's intent so that it was, became more tenable for the, pres the administration's lawyers to say in court that this was not a Muslim ban, but rather something that had something to do with national security. And I think the way that that connects to what is going on is in a couple ways. You know, we're kind of boxed, like, the, we're all kind of boxed in to some extent by the president. The president gets to set, has enormous power. The president has enormous power to set the agenda. We're here talking about wall, and I just met Jessica, but I'm guessing that we don't 
you know, see necessarily eye to eye on all policies. But I think what we probably do see eye to eye <laughs> on is that, you know, months ago, if we had one thing we want to talk about in immigration that we thought might be, might or might not be worth shutting the entire federal government down, I wouldn't have said the wall, and I bet you wouldn't have said the wall. Um, and, you know, and I think that what has gone on since then is the president has gone from a sort of series of manufactured crisis to manufactured crisis because that's what he's good at. He's good at driving attention to whatever it is he wants to talk about, and as president, he can do that. I think that, um, and that's been true of the refugees. And I think that there's not, I mean, I've never seen a lick of evidence to support the idea that um, refugees are coming into this country, that this country is saving, you know, that they view as saving them from potential death where they are, and that they come in and are angry with this country. That hasn't been my experience dealing with refugees, and I was able to deal with some during the travel ban. Um, my experience with them is that they are enormously grateful <laughs> when they get here. Uh, and the, what I want to say is that the president's um, false state claims about the people he deems dangerous matter. They matter because they influence the debate that people have to have, and they matter sometimes because they influence people's lives. Part of the thing is, I, one of the things I have to do as an ACL lawyer is, I, you know, I represent uh, people on free speech cases. I represent people who say really awful things sometimes because they have a right to say it. And so, the pre, you know, as speaking as an ACLU lawyer, the president is out there making bizarre claims about, um, you know, refugees. That may be something that's within his First Amendment rights to do. Now, well, let me ask you a question. Is it fair to associate the negative views that the president has expressed uh, about refugees with the actions of this shooter in Pittsburgh? Well, I'm going to have to answer that question just for me, not for the ACLU. So here's what I'll say. Um, the reason why we value spe free speech in this country is not because speech has no effect on what people do. It's not because no one is ever persuaded by what they hear. We value speech so much in this country because people are persuaded, because people do things in response to what they hear. And if you're the President of the United States, your speech may matter more than anyone's. So he may well have a free amendment right to say those things, but would the people in Pittsburgh be alive today if he hadn't? Yeah, maybe. Jessica, you want to, I want to put the same question to you. So the, there's been a dramatic cutback in the refugee program. There's been uh, a fair amount of rhetoric of suspicion coming from the president about the potential for the refugee program to be a conduit for terrorists. Is it fair to associate the president's views on the refugee program with the actions of this shooter in Pittsburgh? Well, I don't know. I don't know what was going on in the mind of that shooter. Um, I don't think it was policy-driven what he did. I think uh, clearly there was evil working in his soul to commit a crime, a horrible uh, attack like that. Um, but I think, I, I do think a lot of people need to dial their expression of their views back and including the president, uh, but a lot of people on both sides of this issue need to think more about what they're saying and, and how they're saying it and uh, be more respectful in conversation. Certainly present company excluded, but I, I do think that there has been a degradation in the discussion around the immigration issue and that people are too quick to impugn the motives of others have you experienced this? Absolutely, all the time. Yeah. I mean, can you oh, talk a little bit? Oh, about uh, sure. I mean, um, I've s had to sit and, and uh, be verbally abused by members of Congress um, saying horrible things to me because they disagree with me uh, and they disagreed with the testimony that I was asked to come present. Um, certainly, the president needs to... I think temper his words a bit and has expressed things in a very unfortunate way. Um, and I think that um, when our leaders speak in those terms, it does give, 
it, it, it kind of loosens everyone's um, um, thoughts about, you know, it kind of makes it okay for others to speak in those terms. And, and, and I do think that it's a problem now um, that it's difficult to have a conversation like this in a respectful way in many situations and that people have taken it too far. Um, so, yeah, I would like to see more moderation and um, uh, care taken in expression by both sides. So, Rodrigo, you've been involved with organizing the community on the ground here, um, yes. you know, in an environment where obviously there's a lot of pressure on undocumented people. There's a, there, you know, the, the administration has really raised the volume on the questioning of, of you know, why are you here? Um, you know, why did you break the law? Why, you know, why should you have any right to be in this country? And so I guess you've done quite a bit of organizing with undocumented people, right? And mm -hmm. immigrants in general. So what's the mood? Well, What's yeah. the mood and what, what do you, you know, what, what's the purpose of your organizing at this point? Yes, so I think we need to look at, uh, if we were to look at the immigrant rights movement in cycles, right now we're sort of in a winter in the sense that, uh, and that winter really started when, uh, when, uh, when you know, we had a new, the change of administration and the fall prior to that was, was when DAPA had passed but had lost in the courts. So DAPA, I, DAPA being, uh, being, would allow the, the parents and documented parents of, of children born here that have legal status to be able to uh, stay in this country. I, I don't know if there's anything you want to chime in that I might have missed, but that's generally the just Is that the, enough explanation? People know a little bit about what the DAPA program was. It was kind of, it was a, an expansion of the DACA program that mm -hmm. would have included the parents mm -hmm. as well, yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, now that we're in a winter, I, I, really in the immigrant rights movement, what we're having, what we're trying to do is figure out how is it that we can uh, plant the seeds for what might be the next spring of the immigrant rights movement? And, uh, and to give some context to that, that means that right now, in many ways, we're sort of in survival mode. We're trying to figure out how is it that we can respond rapidly to, uh, to you know, deportation or uh, detention uh, uh, you know, hearings or things or rumors that we have in the community that someone's been detained and try to figure out uh, okay, figure out who's, you know, who's uh, maybe a member of that family, who's a friend, and how can we reach to this person? Can we raise money to get them, uh, to get the, uh, you know, to pay the bond? Can we, ex can we get them released? Those are the sort of questions that we're trying to figure out uh, in, in terms of the tensions that are going on. But if you were to, if we're thinking about more strategically speaking, what is the movement doing? We have sort of two main strategies that we're trying to figure out. In red states, it's trying to. Uh, Re, uh, it's trying to reduce uh, the, the amount of dialogue or the cooperation between local enforcement and ICE. And with, uh, with blue states, the work is more of uh, is things like license campaigns, driver license campaigns, so that we can try to stop the, one of the, some of the, one of the main ways that uh, undocumented immigrants get stopped by, by ICE and that get detained and, and, and you know, join that process, which is you know, giving them a license so that when they're driving or giving them an ID so that they don't get detained for that reason. And, and that's sort of been the, the way that we've been trying to manage the situation for now. Uh, but yeah, I think this, uh, at this point in time, there's a lot of people, me, myself having DACA, DACA, there's a lot of people that are younger than me that don't have DACA, that haven't benefited from it. You know, I think uh, just, just like uh, when, we, when Obama was elected, there was a huge, uh, you know, there was the mega marches in 2005, fighting for immigrant rights. That was sort of the spring period of that of that time, and I think at this point we're trying to we're, we're trying to reach that as well by planting seeds. And a lot of people, young immigrants, a lot of parents are trying to be you know are becoming activated and trying to work uh, and trying to join local immigrant organizations so that they can do something. Maybe not now, but in the future. I meant to ask you earlier one question about the wall, which is that there has been some discussion over the past year in Washington about a deal that would essentially be provide a certain amount of border security funding, including, you know, wall funds in exchange for a path to citizenship or some kind of more permanent legal status for people like you who have DACA. Yeah. How would, do you think that, would you go for that deal? Would I go for it? Would I, the community go for would that the community deal? For, yeah, I think uh, the community, there's, you know, there's people that are parents that would love to see their children have uh, some sort of legal status. There would be people that are dreamers like myself uh, that would feel, that would feel, that might feel happy or glad that they have something. You know, I think 
generally there's a, there's a, we have, there's a level of complacency around uh, the immigrant community because we're gonna get whatever we're given. And there hasn't been a lot of organizing to try to get some, or push or have demands for something else. Which, uh, personally speaking, I think that the tone in which we've spoken of as dreamers of being these students that you know, have great grades or have succeeded in life or have you know, climbed up and have some sort of form of American dream, that I, I believe that it's, it, it's that, that, that sort of that argument is made at the same point in time where they, they talk about our parents as if they're criminals or is that they don't belong here. And, uh, you know, there's no way that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna uh, personally uh, uh, try to feel good about any kind of deal that might include me, but, uh, but speaks ill of my parents and all the sacrifice they've made to come But here. would you accept it if it came down? Well, uh, how would you, accepting is not something, like if, if it's there, is there something I can, is I don't have an agency in, in, in doing that. Yeah. You know? There's no agency in me. I mean, if I receive it, I well, receive it. Well, I mean, it, but it would make a difference, <laughs> I think, if dreamers supported it as yeah. opposed to if they... I mean, it's, I don't think there's a consensus. It's more than what I'm trying to say, more than anything. Yeah. You know, people feel, would be glad about it. Some people might feel like it's not enough. Some people feel like it, it's omitting people in the community. There's all, you know, there's all these opinions. I mean, it's always seemed to me that there was an obvious deal to be made, mm -hmm. border security and dream. Yes, I, we, we, I think generally we're seeing this as sort of a token. I guess it's not so obvious that since we haven't made it up to now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's uh, a lot of, so, I don't think there's, I, I don't know, I, that's not something I would support. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't, it, I mean, we know from past experience that uh, when there's a, this grand bargain for amnesty in exchange for in, uh, the promise of enforcement, the amnesty happens immediately and the government does not ever make good on the enforcement piece of it. That's what happened in 1986 with the big amnesty. And I think that's, that experience is what has made that particular proposal uh, impossible for most Republicans, for example, to accept in, the, in, in Congress. That people want to see, the, the, that there is a crisis at the border now uh, and people want those enforcement questions dealt with so that they can have confidence that the laws, when they are changed, will be enforced and that there won't be another wave of people coming over illegally to assuming that there's going to be another amnesty. Okay. Um, so coming off something that Rodrigo said, I wanted to ask you, is Massachusetts a sanctuary state? Well, it is now. It has a, a, a court-imposed sanctuary policy. Uh, the Supreme Judicial Court of the state did what the legislature never wanted to do um, and didn't dare do and has imposed a policy on uh, local law enforcement agencies prohibiting them from holding individuals in custody uh, that when ICE has issued a detainer and or a warrant or a warrant of deportation. They uh, simply, um, ha they've had, the, the court has stripped local law enforcement agencies of that authority to cooperate with ICE. And the result is that when that's um, people who represent a very small fraction of the immigrant population um, are arrested and when ICE learns of them through the Secure Communities Program, the inter fingerprint sharing that goes on. Um, if ICE asks a, a local law enforcement agency to hold that individual so that they can be picked up because they may bond out on local charges, most of them do. I mean, you'd be surprised at the offenses that people can bond out on in Massachusetts. Sometimes very serious charges, including sexual assault. The individuals are released instead of held for ICE, even if it's someone who's been deported before someone that they know is in the country illegally, someone who is, um, has committed um, or, and is charged with a very serious crime, they, they get released back into the community. And ICE has to then go out and try to find them. And, uh, and ICE is in a position of having, you know, instead of being able to arrest someone who may be a danger to the public or at least is, uh, is subject to immigration enforcement, that they've got to, instead of doing that in, in a secure place, the jail, 
they now have to go out to people's neighborhoods. They need to send out a team of people to figure out where these people are, um, when they can be arrested, often in their dwelling, uh, on the street, at a courthouse. That's the very kind of enforcement that immigrant advocates say is frightening to the community, and I agree it is. And it's also more dangerous for ICE agents, but it's what ICE has to do now to do its job because a jail or, or a local police department or even a courthouse, um, people cannot be held there for ICE. Yeah, and the result to, is, I mean, they're getting half of the people, I, I, half of the warrants and detainers that ICE is issuing are, um, they're simply not able to get custody of these people. And these are people who've been arrested. This is not um, broken taillights. Um, it's people who've been arrested for state and local crimes who are back in the community, often reoffending. Half of them are going to reoffend, and it's unnecessary. So you've had some litigation, I think, for people who've been arrested by ICE at courthouses. So maybe maybe you can respond to that. Does it feel like does Massachusetts right. feel like a sanctuary state to you? Uh, not particularly, no. And I don't. But well, I mean, more importantly, I don't think it feels like a sanctuary to for our clients who've been uh, who've had their rights violated. Um, let me take a step back. So the case that uh, Jessica's talking about is a case called Commonwealth against Lund. And, it's, and it does concern this, um, this notion of a detainer. So what's a detainer? A detainer, as Jessica said, is a request by one law enforcement agency to hold on to someone um, at their request. Always accompanied by an arrest warrant. Uh, it is something that ICE calls a warrant, but is not a warrant. Uh, so and it's, it's not, and the, and the Commonwealth, the, the, SG, the court's decision was based on that problem. Normally what happens when somebody is arrested or in Massachusetts or, or is convicted of a crime, they, ha they are jailed and then they either post bail or they don't, or they are sentenced to serve time in, in prison, and then at the end of that, they get out. So the question, so what a detainer is, it's is a request to a state or local um, authority that says that person that you're required by law to release because they posted bond or because their sentence is over, we want you to hold that person for another 48 hours, up, up, to, to. An, up to another 48 hours. And the problem with that, the court said, is that Massachusetts law enforcement doesn't have the authority to just hold people at the request of another law enforcement agency. This is not, Massachusetts is not the first state no, that's had the, 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 this. No, this is because. In Oregon, there have right. been cases this all is because, But ICE is the only agency that they do it to. Well, I can guarantee you if any other agency said, hey, could you hold somebody for us for, based on no law whatsoever, no, they would also tell them that. Based on probable cause, <laughs> wait, they're wait, giving Jessica, them probable let, cause let, under the law. Uh, right. uh, that is an argument that was made to the SJC and was rejected. These are not probable cause warrants. If they were, they, the arrest could be made. So the, that is the basis for the holding. You, Massachusetts law enforcement can't just hold on to someone and jail them at the request of, um, of law enforcement without a legal basis to do it. Now, I should say, that raises the question, well, what happens now, okay? And I agree that there, this is an area where safety is a question. And we have cases on this. And one of the, in one of those cases, a federal um, uh, uh, a witness who we deposed said, notwithstanding this, generally speaking, because of other um, tools at their disposal, the federal government knows in advance when someone's going to get released and, generally speaking, can pick them up without the, war, without the detainer. And that is, generally speaking, what happens. That's according to the federal government's own testimony in our case. I was actually in court also when a, federal, when a lawyer for ICE stood up and said that 90-something percent of the time, they can get them anyway. They don't need the detainer. So uh, that is what's happening now, is they have to get them before be this, this period of time is extended. But there are consequences for people's safety. As Jessica says, one of the things that the federal government is doing seemingly in retaliation for the Lund decision, which they don't like, is they're in stepping up enforcement at courthouses. Well, what happens when you go to courthouses and you wait for people there and you arrest them? People are afraid to go to court. What happens when people are afraid to go to court? Well, if they're a domestic violence survivor, maybe you don't seek a restraining order. If you're a witness to a crime, maybe you don't show up. If you're a defendant charged with a crime of which you're innocent, maybe you don't show up. Do you have a case about this? 
so we have a case, and this goes to a point that Rodrigo is making. We have a case where uh, um, an undocumented person was charged with a driving offense. This is the very, this is the most common thing we see is driving offenses because people don't have licenses. So um, he was charged with, a dri with, with uh, driving on the influence. He said he was innocent. Shows up to court, uh, and after his first hearing, he's arrested in the court parking lot by ICE on his way out. He's taken into ICE detention. He gets a bond hearing, which is a request to be released while he fights his immigration case. He was told, no, you can't be released, and the reason you can't be released is you have an open case in which you've been charged with driving drunk. And he says, well, I didn't do that, and I would like to go fight that case. And they say, well, you can't because you're in ICE detention. So he was locked up in ICE detention on account of having an open criminal case in Massachusetts, which he couldn't fight because he was in ICE detention. But that's because ICE knows they're not getting that person back, just like they don't get the rapists back, just like they don't get the drug traffickers back, and all these other people who have committed these crimes and are allowed to walk out of the courthouse or the jailhouse or the police station when U.S. immigration law gives ICE the authority and says they're allowed to do their job by issuing a detainer and a warrant of arrest. And a judge in Massachusetts decided to nullify federal law. Uh, I don't see it that way, but I will say this. I mean, ICE may have a reasonable concern that if they let someone go, they, will they get them back, okay? But there are ways around this other than putting someone in a catch-22. We filed two lawsuits on this very question, most recently one for this, this um, man who was held in ICE detention. We, went to federal, we had to go to federal court. We filed a lawsuit to say, transport this guy to state court, and then you can have him back. But let him fight, let him fight his case. Okay? So, federal, so we filed that case. As soon, no sooner we filed it, they agreed to let him go to state court. He went to state court, had a trial, and won because he is not guilty. That's what state courts are for, to actually try your case. And then ICE took him back. And he went back into ICE custody, and he had a new bond hearing, and he says, remember that reason why you were holding me, that open case? I won it. And he got posted bond, and he was home for the holidays. So I agree that there are you know, serious security questions, serious law enforcement questions that we have to answer here. But Lawlessness isn't the answer. And what we've seen from ICE, more often than not, has been a disregard for the laws, the very laws that they purport to have others care about. So we're just about at 8.30, and it seems like this is a good moment maybe to take some questions from the audience since. This is called filler while we're collecting the questions. Thank you, uh, Amy. OK, great. Great. Julia, we'll leave it up to you to filter through them and, and, and uh, pose them to our panel. Oh, well, I, this is, a, yeah. So the first question is, should legal immigration be dialed down to protect low or unskilled American workers? Jessica, want, would you want to take a shot at that one? I, yes, I believe uh, our current immigration levels are higher than is in our national interest and so high that it is causing real problems for some people in our community who are being displaced from job opportunities, who are seeing their wages depressed. Um, I mean, we've seen a perfect example of that here in the Boston area a few years back when the Hyatt Company decided to replace their longtime um, housekeeping staff of 92 people, mostly women, many of whom had been working in those jobs for years, raised their kids on those jobs, were being paid uh, something like, I think it was $14 an hour at the time, this is back in probably almost 10 years ago, uh, paid benefits, paid sick leave, vacation, and they were told to train their replacements, literally. Instead, Hyatt went with a staffing company in, uh, who brought in workers who were in the country illegally and instead paid them much less than $10 an hour, no benefits, no paid time off for sick leave or vacation. And this is 
what happens when employers are allowed to uh, get away with hiring illegal workers. And the same thing happens when we have a legal immigration system that is bringing in people who are not well equipped to necessarily um, work in high skill, high wage occupations. They too are displacing uh, Americans who are now out of work. We, we bring in about a million legal immigrants a year. About half a million people are settling here illegally each year and more than half a million guest workers. And that is having effects on people who are, for whatever reason, haven't gotten a, a college education. Uh, in some cases, it's affecting white collar workers who are competing with guest workers. So yes, we need to cut it back. We need to, uh, I believe we need to cut back on the chain migration categories um, and uh, the visa lottery and um, reform our employment-based immigration system as well. But I think, yeah, the numbers are too high. So I would just point out that we do have the lowest unemployment in the United States right now that we've had in, what, 20 years or something like that? So, yeah, it, so we also there have doesn't seem to be an unemployment problem. I'm six gonna million ask, high I'm, school dropouts who are not looking for work and are not counted in the unemployment rate. Yeah. And about 40 million total in that category. So, I'm, Rodrigo, I'm going to ask you to also respond to that question. Should legal immigration be dialed down to protect low or unskilled American workers? Uh, well, I think as it stands, you know, the immigration system is disorderly, and we, make it, we need to make it more orderly. And however, I think uh, that currently present within the United States, there are over 11 million undocumented immigrants, many of them who work in this country. And I think we need to understand that there's an economic, as I was saying before, an economic reliance on, on people that are undocumented. For that, for the hired company to hire, hire undocumented workers, is it on the fault of the, of is it on the fault of the immigrants themselves, or is it on the fault of that kayak company? Right? Who is it? Who, you know, like, there, it's, it's not just a relation, it's not, it's not a one-way relationship where we're getting hired, but there's a, it's a two-way relationship. There's also the employers are well, as well that are benefiting from the exploitation of workers that are, are you saying, are getting paid $10 an hour, are getting, un, you know, they're, they're getting sick leave, they're not getting any vacation, whatever that may be. And we need to, we need to make sure that the way we address, I think, illegal immigration, I think the way that we change the framing of, of how we understand what is an immigrant is, I think for a long time we've been trying to do it uh, you know, via electoral means. And I think this time, for I think the next cycle of the immigrant rights movement, we're going to have to do it in a way where we actually show our economic power. And I think that means, uh, you know, what would it look like if undocumented immigrants or and immigrants uh, that, are, that support undocumented immigrants what if they strike where they have an opportunity to actually show the economic dependency that, they, uh, that, uh, that this country has on immigrants? So I think that's something that we're going to have to try to resolve. Uh, here's a question. It says, unless you believe in open borders and think illegal immigration is a good thing, why is a wall immoral? Does anyone want to take a shot at that one? Unless you believe in open borders and think illegal immigration is a good thing, why is a wall immoral? I'll take a crack at that one. Okay. You know, I, I, um, I guess there's no beginning of that question that could make me think that building a monument to Donald Trump at our southern border is a good idea. Um, and so that's what that is. I mean, I think that the subtext for every debate that we've seen and the... Um, the reason why it's been such a difficult impasse to overcome, or at least one reason, seems to be that this is no one's first choice of how to deal with immigration. Uh, and the, you know, there are not terrorists who are streaming through the border. The San Isidoro port of entry may have some problems, but like that is not creating a crisis in America. So you know, our president's fixated on this idea of a wall. I would also say that, yeah, and that's, you know, that is the problem, is the fixation. And with the fixation comes is, is born of this scapegoating, um, and I want to say you know the there's the term open borders. Um, you know I'm I'm a civil rights lawyer. Uh, the the goal that we've had uh, in our work has not necessarily been to achieve a particular immigration outcome. 
It is to make sure that our laws and freedoms in this country are respected. And what we have seen, whether it's family separation, which is a nice way of saying stealing children again, or um, the uh, travel ban and this court case. I mean, we have a case where our clients are eligible to receive green cards based on regulations that the government itself issued. And when two of our um, people showed up for their inter immigration interviews to confirm that they're married to US citizens, which is the basis of pursuing their green cards, they were arrested. They were arrested seeking the green, their green cards through a system set up by the United States government in a sting operation to catch them following the law. So, you know, I think that is the backdrop to some of the things we've seen about the, law, about the, the border wall. It, it, it is consistent with what we've seen from the administration, which is a disrespect for the laws of this country rather than an attempt to protect them. Um, we have a question about the DACA program. Uh, basically, it says, what is going to happen to the, uh, likely to happen to the DACA recipients? Are they currently being deported? Uh, I don't know, maybe, Matt, if you can speak more to this, but uh, in my experience, there have been people, you know, that regardless if you have DACA or not, you know, that we're still being detained. And uh, because I feel like in some ways, and within the immigration system, there is no, sometimes there's no due process in the way that we get treated. There's expedited hearings, or we don't, sometimes we don't even know where people are, so people don't have a chance to be represented. Uh, and I think for people that have DACA right now, it, it is, uh, it, it is a, a way that, uh, a protection for many of us now that for be able to stay in this country legally. And um, yeah, people are not, I mean, in my experience, a lot of people are not getting deported. We're not able to travel out of the country. Uh, they know, you know, they know where we live. We have to let them know where we live every, you know, for every two years, what job we have, you know, what, how much are we making, all this information, uh, the government has it. So uh, really it's, uh, in my experience, there hasn't been a lot of, of deportations of documented people uh, from my community, but uh, yeah, the, the government itself has, knows a lot of information about us right now, so they can't keep tabs on us in any way that they want. But the current situation is that Correct me if I'm wrong, but that that this the cancellation of DACA has been suspended by the federal courts. That's right. And so current pe people who had DACA at the time of the cancellation were are have still been able to renew. That's right. But no new DACA uh, permits have been issued. I believe no. Am I right about that? Does it? I think so. I yes. think that, I'm I trying think to think if people who are aging into the program. I don't think. No, they it, you they, had to arrive not. before so June. Uh, potentially, the, the people before. who are yeah. too young to have DACA at the time are now vulnerable to. Mm -hmm. They're out of status. They they could technically be deported. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, when you when we. Although well, I don't know of any cases where that's happened. I haven't unless heard of they cases. have become a priority for some other reason. Yeah. Yeah, when Obama announced it, it was in 2012, you had to be in president in the country, and I believe for around five years prior to that, you had to be in the country as well. So uh, if you didn't fit that, and you had to be below, I think, the age of 30. So if you didn't fit that, uh, if you don't fit that, uh, cat those categories, then you're not allowed to be, uh, to have DACA. And I, I believe now uh, we're not able to apply, or new people are not able to apply. And really, that's because, uh, the, the reason why it happened was because I believe Trump wanted an expedited hearing for, for DACA in the Supreme Court. However, uh, that was denied, so now it has to go through the whole right. appellate system. Heading for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's a question. The U.S. is the major industrialized nation with the greatest per capita greenhouse emissions and resource <clears throat> use generally. Global warming is projected to shrink the U.S.'s carrying capacity, drying out the climate throughout much of the country. Under such conditions, does it make sense for the U.S. to continue to allow immigration at the rate of nearly one New York state per decade? So we have, here we have um, an environmental argument uh, for less immigration. Does anyone? Well, 
more than 70% of our population growth is immigration generated. Um, so that is, immigration is the major driving force be behind population growth, and population growth is driving um, crowding, sprawl, housing shortages, and so on, along with other things, of course, as well. Um, without, or if we were to moderate uh, immigration, then the growth of the U.S. population certainly would level off over time, and, and that would make it easier to deal with resource, natural resource shortages, um, sprawl, crowding, and all of these environmental concerns that are exacerbated by population growth. Can, yeah. So I understand, I mean, with, with respect to the questioner, um, I, I mean, it does sound like the question is sort of, can the Titanic be saved by moving the deck, deck chairs? You know, it's, it, I mean, I, I, I accept the premise of the question that, um, that we're in a climate crisis. But I'm not sure that we're that the solution to it is going to be, you know, keeping more people in Guatemala. And uh, and and so, you know, my hope would be partly that, you know, maybe there will be children of immigrants who will work, you know, in this country to help solve this crisis of the climate. But also, you know, if that is the, you know, it, 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 again, we're about to hear a nationalized speech by the president of the United States. I accept the premise of the question as true. In the midst of a climate crisis that is threatening people all over the earth, and the subject of the nationally televised discuss, you know, speech tonight is going to be whether we build a wall in between you know, Mexico and the United States. And I would think that the president's attention could be better spent on the actual crisis that is the subject of this question and not, you know, this monument he wants to build. But if I you think to add to that, I think, no, it's okay, thank you. I think to add to that, I think um, we need to understand the reason why we're in a climate crisis is because of the way, is, is the manner in which we consume as a country. We're, the, we consume resources without, able to, without being able to, uh, without enough resources to meet those needs. And uh, because of the patterns that, that, have, that, that have occurred in that, you know, people become displaced, people from, from countries that are, you know, island countries become displaced, you know, rising sea levels have, and uh, all, a lot of challenges with corporations uh, displacing people out of their lands have caused more challenges where people, where people have to immigrate, they have to move, and that's in itself another reason why uh, I think immigration is being driven into the country, but I think that immigration in itself won't be able to change that. It's, a, it's not just a U.S. problem, it's a problem of the whole world that we'll have to address. It's the, we have to address some fundamental things in the way that we live uh, in this country. We're gonna have to change the way that we consume, the way that we, the way that we engage with, the, with uh, our natural resources, and uh, I think that's just a larger question. But you're right, if you accept that the United States bears a disproportionate responsibility for climate change, and if po our population growth is one of the things driving our environmental footprint that we leave then it's hard to escape the argument that continuing such rapid population growth is, is not going to make it harder to deal with this problem. Well, generally, people are having less children, and I think time could be better spent protecting the rainforest in the Amazon, or it could be spent building and creating jobs that could uh, create more uh, you know, uh, solar panels, uh, windmills, things like that that could support you know, cleaner air. I think that's just, we need to focus on what's right, and I think that's just immigration itself isn't going to solve the problem. So uh, this question says, I'm here for Matthew Denise, who couldn't be here tonight. He was killed by an illegal alien. Do you think that Matthew's civil rights were violated by a government that chooses not to enforce its laws? that question? Uh, I just want to say I'm terribly sad for the person who have, who's in a position to write that, and um, it sounds like an awful thing. I'm a parent, um, and I can imagine, uh, I can't imagine uh, really 
how, how terrible that must feel. Um, but no, I don't have an answer to the civil rights question. No, I'm not going to speak to that. Well, this is the thing. It's, it, there is a human cost sometimes to our failure to enforce our immigration laws. And um, it, by no means is that it does that mean that uh, all immigrants, all illegal immigrants pose a threat to anyone? But when we don't enforce laws, uh, when we have policies that serve to protect those who are causing harm, I mean, that's really the issue, is how can we enforce our laws in a way that makes sure that that small fraction of people who are going to do harm are the focus of enforcement efforts. Um, and, and, and I think that there's a pretty clear record that sanctuary policies are protecting the wrong people. I, I do want to say just to that, I mean, I think that there, there are, people have different views. And, you know, Jessica and I may have different views about how best to, you know, what, what, the, what laws are best. But everyone who's coming at this problem is coming at it from the perspective of trying to do come up with a system that's going to work best for the, for the most people possible. You know, when we talk, you know, there, there are people who don't think that um, law enforcement should respect detainers. There are p police chiefs that we're in touch with who say, look, if, if, you know, people in the immigrant community are afraid of law enforcement, then we don't hear about crimes, we don't hear about dangerous people that we want to hear about to keep communities safe. So I think one thing that, you know, is kind of encouraging about a lot of the work that we do is that, I might want to set the president aside, but a lot of the people that we are in touch with, even when we disagree, you know, everyone is trying to come up with a system that's going to work best for everybody so that, it, you know, people are as safe as possible. Yeah, and I, I think I just want to, I don't want to politicize it, I just want to express my condolences for the family as well of Matthew. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, to have real, to, you know, there's, there's, true safety and there's what I would argue false safety and I think one is because you know your neighbor and the other one is because you can hurt your neighbor, uh, deport them and I think it's a false dichotomy. I think we need an integrated country. We need, I think, for us to not to, to, to make sure that we are protecting the community here. Uh, we need to make sure that we know each other and, and we're able to have an opportunity to have dialogue or have an opportunity to make sure that we're addressing some of these, uh, some of these issues, you know, but yeah, I think I think we need to we need to make a difference between I think uh, between having a uh, you know uh, for the whole community immigrant community I think there's you know, have between having fear there has to be some faith that maybe together we can resolve something and create something together that might be better and I think that's really up to us getting to know each other a little bit more. So, yeah. So no, I think this is this is probably a good place. In you know, the president's going to be speaking in ten minutes, and maybe there are people in the audience that do want to hear him speak. And so maybe this is a good place for us to. Great. So we'll conclude things there. I want to thank our panel and our esteemed moderator. Thank you. 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 Thank you.